trip to Singapore and love Singapore. Um, visited Universal Studios and so forth. So it was a great spot to visit. So today, what I share with you will be coming from uh, my book that was brought out in 2019, Physical Education and Wellbeing, Global and Holistic Approaches to Child Health. Um, as Will said, he's got various resources available on, on my uh, personal website, personal professional website. If you need any resources, if you email me, um, I'm more than happy to accommodate and help you out any of the resources. I'm going to take some excerpts from my book um, to set the scene um, and take you on this journey. So this book sits within what Greenfield refers to deep thinking, content or meaning. We talk about that a lot in education, about that uh, diving deeper. It's a combination of years of evidence-based qualitative research. So the stories, practical experience and internal insight carefully crafted to make meaning. Thus, the findings build upon the abundance of quantitative research that's out there supporting children's well-being enhancement through holistic physical education. The physical dimension is a powerful pathway for children's learning and holistic development. It cannot be stressed enough that learning through movement involves children from the very beginning of primary elementary school, truly belonging, being and becoming physically educated. So that inclusive element. Hence, P is every teacher's friend in enhancing children's well-being now and in the future. So I believe strongly that every single teacher in the classroom should be confident and competent in, in teaching through movement and using physical education um, to enhance learning. We're dealing, especially in the early years and primary school, we're dealing with children full of energy and we should be able to exploit that for their learning. The problem that it builds upon is how PE can be successfully implemented in primary elementary schools around the world. Helen Harris argued the importance to reflect critically on how best to promote active lifestyles for all children and young people. Quantitative research has examined the benefits of physical activities and literature, has advocated QPE, quality physical education, and the notion of lifelong physical activity in schools since the 1940s. However, while it can be argued this has been achieved in various schools, Sadly, research suggests this has been far too few in number, including developed nations. Literature and research have indicated this flaw for many years, and despite more recent focused efforts, enacting policies continues to be a major barrier to children's health and well-being. So just about all countries have great policies that um, um, look really good with, with PE and health and PE, um, but it's, it's being able to get that implemented into every single classroom. Um, so I, at the moment, a bit like Dulwich College Singapore, I'm in a private school, independent school. We have a very, very good PE team. We have great facilities and our children are very fortunate. But as we know, there's schools around. Some government schools offer a great PE program. There's quite a few who don't. Um, and so it's being able to be inclusive then as a whole, a whole collective where all children can ex have that um, positive experience of PE. And, and carry that throughout life. There's a tradition of problems. Um, none of these will be new to you. Taught by inadequately trained teachers, insufficient curriculum time allocation, perceived inferior subject status, inadequate provision of facilities and equipment and teaching materials, uh, and underfunding. There's large class sizes and funding cuts. Some countries limited awareness of pathway links to wider community programs. And that carries through to today. That was from 2008, a big study that Harbin did. That, that would be the same today in, in a lot of schools. Within Asia specifically, a study by UNESCO found that there's limited space and equipment for PE and sports co-curricular. Co uh, overcrowded classes of 40 or more students in each PE class, not a strong sports culture. Important decisions on PE and sports often made by the government officials with no academic or professional qualifications in the discipline. And PE and sports are commonly considered as play rather than subjects that develop the thinking capacity, not given that academic um, weighting. But as we know, as we go through these slides, and as you'd all be aware, if we want to do well academically, PE is a great way of, a great vehicle for being able to achieve that. Evidence points to deficiency in teacher supply, in particular of physical education specialists, inadequate preparation of physical education especially but not exclusively so in primary elementary schools, 
and to negative attitudes and low levels of motivation of some teachers responsible for physical education delivery. Concerns about the quality of physical education, teacher training, teaching and teaching resources, inadequate supervision of practice, lack of professionalism and appropriate ethics and impacts on the quality of school pupil experience are also globally evident. And this came out, this summary came out from UNESCO in 2014, which is an accurate summary there. So this book investigates quality physical education implementation in primary schools around the globe, offering realistic direction to universally enhance children's health and well-being. And I think that through COVID, we've realised just how important that is, using the physical uh, to promote health and well-being. David Kirk, Professor David Kirk from the University of Strathclyde, Glasgow. David Kirk, when he was younger, worked in Australia. He was uh, involved in, uh, I guess, the first effort a national curriculum in Australia. Australia's up till recently was similar to America. In, the, in America, the US, they have each state has its own curriculum and Australia was similar. So in the UK, we have a national curriculum, which is truly national. Um, and that's, it's probably to do with the geographical size too of the different countries. Australia now does have a national curriculum. The history of physical education. When he spoke at our recent, in Australia, the recent um, curriculum review and development and release of the documents, he said, it's been my conviction, conviction for some time and something that I've argued in public that most of us in health and physical education do not know the history of our field particularly well. And this places us in a very precarious situation in terms of readiness to face change. He advised to look to the past for lessons about the present and where we might be heading in the future. So I'm gonna look at the past and also we'll see what the present looks like. I won't touch on the future at the moment, but we, I think we have a good idea of how important PE is um, and, and we can imagine how we want that to be involved in the future. So PE, right back to ancient civilization, we know people had to move to survive. They didn't have a school structure back then, but from the very beginnings, Movement's always been important. Beginning of 700 before Common Era, the Spartans uh, had physical education, similar educational experience of both males and females, which is what something is where, where there's a big focus at the moment. Um, object, the objective for women's PE was basically to, to breed healthy warriors. The Athenians have had a holistic approach from that time to exploit the objectives of physical education in Athens, use of education more broadly was to educate the mind and the body, to unite the man of action with the man of wisdom, to produce a well-integrated person. So we see this holistic uh, theme that we have today right back to BCE. Balance between music and gymnastics. Um, in the past, the Greek ideal Men sano incorpore sano stress the importance of having a healthy mind with a healthy body. This communic highlights the importance of a comprehensive, educationally based and strategical approach to wellness that values the role of the health and physical educator. As addressed throughout the book, holistic HPE is not a new concept to education, but has more recently been given greater recognition to the contribution that the learning area makes in developing the whole child and the important role of physical dimension plays in well-being. Just to digress for a little bit, focus on the education of physical education. So education, from two Latin words, what do we mean by that? Educare and educare, which means to lead out and to train or mould. Supported that it was a balance between educare and educare, the passing on of knowledge and preparing students for the changes that they will face in the future the best represents the term education. So education just isn't at school, it's holidays, it's all learning that happens, it involves parents, and we've seen that shift within schools. Within schools, um, teachers are taking on more responsibilities, responsibilities for things that are done at home, such as online learning, um, such as children's uh, working with social media. We're taking more and more responsibility of that parent. However, um, a lot more than when I went to school. Um, I'll move along. 
Okay, so the purpose, what is the purpose of education? I was at a school recently in Brunei and we sat down and we looked at our curriculum and we asked the question, what is the purpose of education? What is important to us? And different people have different um, priorities. So understanding about how learning happens, our lens, okay, and we may have different metaphors for that. There's also the, what we see more and more in education, the psychological perspectives, the biological, the importance of connections and plasticity, behavioural, which we see with rewards and giving dojo points and things like this, what people do, the cognitive and metacognitive, the thinking about thinking and the values we have today and how important that is, thinking about the how we learn, Psychoanalytic, the unconscious and hidden messages. Phenomenological and humanistic, empowering the individual to be the best they can be. And we can see all of these within the schools, just about all schools, um, but to different degrees. And then the educational approaches, which we'll look at, is reflect teachers' belief about how children learn. Why do teachers do what they do in the classroom? Surely it's because they believe this is effective. This works for me. Um, this is the way I connect with the children. So it's, it's important for us to stop and reflect. We, we do that a lot with the children and teach them about reflection and about being resilient and all these learning values. But it's important also for teachers, that reflection, that reflective practitioner. So the behavioural approach, this in the UK, um, this would relate to the old curriculum, even though they used aspects of similar to the new curriculum. I'm not saying that they didn't have the inquiry-based approach, for example. But... The behavioural is the oldest and most dominant, linear, teacher controlled, separate subjects, um, which we relate to old schooling. Help with the nation's economy, be more productive, top-down directive. It's often about saving money. We can see large classes, the behavioural. And we're not saying that you don't use the behavioural aspects. There's a place for it. But it's just being aware of what we're predominantly doing. The constructivist, the holistic, Child learning across emotional, social, physical, and cognitive areas or dimensions. Um, the active learning, the play-based learning, the open-ended materials, the deep questions, um, the inquiry-based learning. Uh, Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, using the teacher to as a facilitator to draw out and have the child be, become more independent. So that relates to the... The latest curriculum, the 2014 curriculum in England, uses that approach, as do most curriculums around the world at the moment. In, 19, in about 2000, I, my PhD was about looking at the introduction of the Queensland Health and Physical Education Syllabus. Um, this was quite a significant uh, implementation of this syllabus material because its name became Health and Physical Education throughout Australia. Um, so it had that holistic approach. It was about lifelong learning. It used, as you can see these pictures on the left, it, you can see the lifelong learner, which is very similar to 21st century learning, complex thinker, creative person, active investigator, and so forth. And there we also have on the left, the inquiry-based model, four stages of understanding, planning, acting, and reflecting. It was a learner-centered approach. Now, when that came out, it's very easy for teachers to go, right, this is how we've got to do it and think you've got to do this all the time. And so you, you then replace some of the things that work that would relate to behavioural approach with always doing inquiry-based learning. Okay? But it's about the balance, and I'll keep coming back to that throughout. A lesson may have different approaches, and that's okay. It's just being aware of what approach, where it sits, and how often you're using it. So basically, Australia... It was acknowledged by the Australian government that Australia was one of the only a few countries that combines the strains of health and PE in one curriculum. Um, many countries require the study of physical education over all the school years, but generally speaking, there is greater focus on health and wellbeing in the Australian. Um, and you'll see with physical literacy that that's becoming more spread throughout throughout the world and an acknowledgement of the health and wellbeing. And we'll see that as a, we go along. Okay, holistic HP requires an inclusive, developmentally appropriate and progressive infrastructure beginning within the early years of primary schools. I'll keep coming back to how important that is in the early years. Um, there was a, an organisation, HBSD World Congress in 1958. The theme was child health and the school. So it's, it's been along and been around since the Athenians. Uh, more recently, 
as as Kirk says, since the 1940s. It's always been around, but you'll see it coming in and out at present and, and having an understanding of when we're using a health or holistic approach and when we're just focusing on the physical and leaving it as separate. Um, it's impacted many parts of the world within the curriculum policy. Has it hit the ground within the classrooms? Perhaps not. And it's, I call it the, uh, the book I brought out in 2016, Health, Wellbeing and Physical Education Revolution. And that's what we're going through at the moment. Countries of best practice had common theme relating to promotion of health and healthy lifestyles from a big survey by UNESCO. So it's very important. A growing number of nations have made a shift to a holistic HP curriculum, and these numbers are arising. Nations embracing health, wellbeing, and PE include, you can see a number of countries here, in policy, Australia, USA, UK, Wales, and Scotland mainly, New Zealand, Singapore, Canada, China, Malaysia, Brunei, Dar es Salaam, Philippines, Japan, Nepal, Thailand, Cambodia, Indonesia, India, Sri Lanka. And I'll let you read through those, but there's many, many countries that are giving recognition to health and physical education in their policy documents. So here's the English present physical education programs, the National Curriculum of England. And it has remained as a focus on PE. And I understand why that is because PE is significant and we need to do quality PE. We don't want to replace quality PE with the teaching of health and well-being. It's not about that. It's about enhancing health and well-being through still having quality PE and a lot of physical movement. With the focus on PE and not, not recognition of the health and well-being, though, we can see that the National Curriculum Draft purported a holistic approach in the UK, in England. It preceded the Rose Review and was suitably titled Understanding Physical Development, Health and Wellbeing. This holistic health, wellbeing and PE curriculum, however, was discarded in 2010 with the change of government. But what it did do is it planted the seed for future reform. So there's been acknowledgement of this holistic. Moving along with approaches, the last approach out of the three that we're looking at is critical. Um, Greta, who we haven't heard a lot of recently, but before COVID, um, you know, we had students walking through the streets protesting um, having their voice heard. So that reflective approach where the teacher is no longer the author authoritative, but as an intellectual, enables students to develop critical consciousness of their own oppression and to act on the world as they learn in order to change it. So having these w marching through streets throughout the world, um, we're seeing children take action and that's that critical approach. Okay, so the... Uh, Looking at the revolution, a shift towards a constructivist, which is the inquiry-based, and critical taking action, social cultural approach, which is inclusive education, has experienced a health, wellbeing and physical education revolution described as a, glowing, a growing global curriculum reform, one that is in the best interest of the whole child. This is where PE is not seen as a single 45 minute lesson that may occur once a week, but rather where the physical education lesson is acknowledged as a platform to wellbeing infused across all curricular and extracurricular activities within school as well as a child's greater community. This includes the complex layers of relationships between individuals and groups involving personal, interpersonal environmental factors. We have research evidence that in many nations, a health, wellbeing and peer revolution often only exists as policy. For this to happen, I wrote an article uh, a few years ago. It's called, How Does a PE Teacher Become a Health and, a health and Physical Education Teacher? Now, within that article, it looked at, well, how does this happen? A lot of people get confused with, well, I'm a PE teacher. I've got to do this. This is what I'm responsible for. But it's taking that, it's acknowledging how important the physical is throughout the whole school. And it's about communication with the teachers. Of course, it helps with leadership, um, helping direct that. But in many schools, the PE teacher often is a leader. And, and being able to lead and make those connections with the teachers. Sometimes the PE teacher may be segmented from the other teachers, not feel part of it. It's about being inclusive within the staff, everyone being valued, and it's about having strong communication so that we can exploit and optimise the physical and the movement for that child. Which if you ask a child, would you like movement throughout, the, throughout many subjects, of course they would agree. 
So what would that look like? It's having that quality P less than once a week, twice a week if you're fortunate. But it's also talking and sharing your curriculum. So if the teachers get another opportunity to go out, which they may do, they can also continue on with those skills or games. It's about um, sharing various inclusive games and skills with the with the other teachers. Um, it's about taking that leadership and having perhaps having the teachers come together and identify which parts of in the English curriculum, the PSHE, or the health aspects and, and well-being. And it's just being someone to lead that. That's what is, is the difference between the physical education and the health and physical education teacher. So which approach? We need to increase understanding with regard to the complexity surrounding this issue. If I was to walk into a school and say, what, which approach of, to education are you using? A lot of teachers would just look at me. That was something they learnt in first year at university when they really didn't have anything to reflect on other than their own education. But now as a teacher, lots of teachers go back, they might do further research, be it um, through university with a research degree and master's and so forth, or PhD, or it may be through doing an MPQSL or something similar. But using this research, we then reflect, and this is what I did too as a, as a teacher, I reflect on my practice of what works and what doesn't work within our context. And so it becomes a lot more valuable. And I think we need to keep touching base with teachers with these approaches. When we bring in a new program, we have to see, look at our programs that we're using, look at where the, what predominant, predominant approach we're using and ask ourselves, where does that fit in? It's not just about throwing money at a quick fix. It's about carefully, like a coach does, sporting coach, carefully bring in a player that fits and keeps the team balanced. And that's what teachers need to be able to do and leaders in the schools need to be able to do, keep that team balance and that curriculum balance and keep that approaches to education balance. So all approaches are important. Under the current curriculum, of course, the constructivist and critical are given predominantly more weighting. Schools tend to commit to one approach, although many educators do not. So a school might say we're using the inquiry-based approach, but the actual teaching going on in the classrooms is chalk and talk. One approach in some situations and another approach in other situations, it is contextual and that's okay. Um, and I think it's through teachers reflecting on what approach they use and why that will open them up to being um, more willing to try different things. That's a whole environment that we have to sit, set in the school, similar to classrooms. And at, at, we all know how important it is to set that environment of everyone belonging and that secure environment in the classroom for children to do their best. It's no different to staff, we're just big kids. And it's not looking at failing, but learning from mistakes and having this positive growth mindset that enables that school to be the best they can be for the children. Okay, so what is the purpose of education when we looked at in Brunei at our curriculum? Developing practical skills to strengthen the productivity. And that is a big one for Singapore over the last 10 years or so. That they that is a uh, priority for them. S prepare and deal with the future for 21st century learning. Again, that's a priority with ICT and looking at the future. A lot of schools got heavily involved with that during uh, COVID. Develop the child, the personalised learning, the well-being, the whole person. Critique society, equity and social justice, um, the critical approach, and introduce students to the best that has been thought of and said. And that's another priority within Singapore. So I've got a short clip here. Um, I will play, this is where I got a lot of the ideas uh, for what's happening at present in Singapore. Singapore are known as one of the leading countries with the OECD tests, such as what would be uh, your PISA or your NAPLAN in Australia, um, these year six tests, and, and also for the 15 year olds, uh, PISA tests and TIMS and so forth. I'll just play now. If the, if the volume doesn't work, I'll just keep moving along. It's only a short clip. Can you hear that? No, there's no sound on it. Tim. Okay. It's all right. Okay. So that was just uh, one of the education department leaders talking about what their priorities have been in Singapore. Right. So to come from that uh, short clip, you might be familiar with this. Nagi and Secondary School is a future school. They have future schools in Singapore that encourage innovation and enterprise in teaching practice, flexible learning environments with a special emphasis on the use of technology and digital media. So you can see the, the importance of 
what is the purpose of education there? Teachers are valued, and this is a big theme coming through also in Finland. Teachers are extremely valued. Teachers have, uh, have evidenced their ability and passion to be quality teachers on the selection process. And when I say teachers are valued, they're held in high esteem with doctors and lawyers and other professions in this field. They're also paid good money, and it's a real process of being selected. Pedagogy contact knowledge, what is that? It's understanding how we can teach the different strategies, understanding deeply your content and understanding how to deliver that to the children in your context or the students. Having a professional learning community, which I can see with the turn up today is, is important in Singapore and lifelong education. Collaboration, innovation, challenge, challenging the children. And these are themes coming throughout, throughout the world. Shift to teacher as facilitator, pupil as researchers and being independent. And these are similar to all schools. So a lot of different uh, education departments throughout the world have looked at Singapore as leaders. They've looked at Finland as leaders. Um, in Australia, to become a teacher, it's a four-year degree. If you study a degree first, for, for example, um, secondary, and then do a postgraduate dip ed, um, it is two year and it becomes a master's of teaching, a two year degree. And they're not the only country with that. There's other countries around with similar. But four years to become a teacher. If you do a degree first in history or whatever it might be, um, geology, for example, then it's another two years. So it's five years of training to become a teacher following Finland and, and Singapore models. 21st century lifelong learning skills. You'd all be familiar with this. We all know how important all of these aspects are, communication, numeracy, ICT skills, thinking skills, problem solving, self-management, co competitive skills, study and work skills, social skills, physical skills and aesthetic skills. If we go to the, um, in England and the early years framework, um, if you look at that, it, it has three main things, one being physical movement, one being language and literacy, and also the social and emotional. So you can see that, Often, when we look at early years and look at the learning going on, that often infiltrates and works its way up um, to, to, the, to education, influences education throughout school right up to, to A-levels. Physical education is the only curriculum subject whose focus combines the body and physical competence with value-based learning and communication provides a learning gateway to grow the skills required for success in the 21st century. That's from UNESCO, Quality Physical Education 2015. So it's the only one where we're learning through movement and we know how important that is and the value-based learning that it, we can have. It can also have the opposite effect as we know. You, uh, I remember talking to different, when I started working in higher education, we'd get some older staff members would come over to me and say, oh, when I went to school, PE was horrible. I hated it. So PE movement is a powerful vehicle and it can have very positive effects, but if not done right, it can have very negative effects. In our school at present, we are an IB learner uh, school and we have an IB learner profile. In our junior school, we use the National Curriculum of England, but you'd be familiar with learning values, which are you'll find in most schools. How they're implemented makes a big difference. Um, how are they truly in the classroom? Do the children identify them? Does the, does the teacher give feedback relating to them? Do they give dojo points in relation to them? Is this what's ruling our or the goals of our behaviour and so forth? This is what we have at the moment. And what the children did was design a character and a name so that we could easily remember them and the ch younger children could relate to them more. We, in our school, we have been implementing these for, for over the last 12 months, and we still we know we still have a we need to keep going with this, to keep pushing, um, and keep deeply implementing it in everything we do. Our feedback policy relates to this, um, and it's very important. So that's an example of the holistic learning, and this is also extremely important to phys ed and to sports and to how we reward children or what we acknowledge feedback given. So when we give feedback, we can give feedback on the content or what we want the children to do. So in PE, for example, so we're learning um, striking and you've gone through some the correct um, process for striking, given some feedback, 
yeah, you give feedback on the striking motion, how they're holding the bat and so forth. But also this is about how we're learning and these can tie in with the feedback. Right, uh, from a chapter four in a health and wellbeing um, book, which is there, the, let me just go back. There we go, health and wellbeing and childhood. The physical dimension is significant within children's learning because it, often, it offers powerful and meaningful connections across all learning and development areas. The social cultural perspective, which is that inclusive nature, suggests that the curriculum ought to be connected to the child's world and everyday interests. And we see that when teachers are planning with what's going on in the world that's relevant, with what the children are interested in, such as Harry Potter and things like this. Since children have a natural play structure, learning through movement heightens their interest. And this is the important factor that all teachers need to, to understand and need to use, not just the PE teachers who truly believe in it, but everyone. Everyone needs to exploit. Everyone needs to think through the mind of a child and and realize just how energetic they are and the balance they need and how fun learning can be through movement. Um, here is what we call layers of learning, uh, which isn't a lot of schools have this, um, but again, it relates to reflection. Um, it can be reflective for, for teachers and we use with the pupils at our school. Tut is the picture there, the ancient Egyptian God who is known for being a scribe and, and and the God of knowledge from ancient Egypt. Um, so we have it's this acknowledgement of, I'm at the beginning of my learning and understanding, and that's okay. If we're beginning to ride a bike, it's okay to make mistakes, to fall off your bike. It's, it's normal when we take the training wheels off. When there's less mistakes, less errors with riding a bike or riding a story, um, it's, it's understanding that you, you're in that level two then, which we relate back to motor skills. We have the associative, um, automatic, um, cognitive, cognitive being level one where we're learning, associative where we're making mistakes but we're improving, and level three that automatic of the skill you're able to to do it without thinking. Um, so in level two, making mistakes but it's getting better, or not pushing themselves and challenging themselves. Sometimes children will have different options, differentiated learning, different challenge questions or different challenge tasks, and if they choose the easy task and they're not challenging themselves. They're gliding and they're not, they're not getting to level three, which, is, which is, is the aim. Level three, I am challenged and I achieve. I use learning values to be my best. Okay, so the three drivers we have at our school, which, which I guess everyone needs to um, consider, and, and also even if, when we're planning for PE, the community is a really important one. Thinking, how does this relate to the cognitive and thinking about thinking of being growth mindset and positive and the values and values is really important how we teach the values through the movement through PE classes um, it's a it's a perfect situation for children to be kind to be inclusive to be understanding so all approaches have a place which I've been um, emphasizing throughout this talk should not be pre a prevalence of certain approaches and pedagogies embedded within over others although at the moment we have a predominantly inquiry-based. What does inquiry-based look like in PE? Well, it's not going to look the same as it does in teaching health or teaching geography. But we still have our basic for a basis of where the children have to learn. And we may, when we're demonstrating, use that, that behavioural approach and chalk and talk, but it's only short and we get the children out um, practising the skills in a fun, um, inclusive manner through games and so forth. Curriculums for geography, history, health and science all privilege inquiry based on student-centered teaching and learning. So when we have our learning journeys, our themed um, interconnected units, these are the subjects that work well with inquiry-based learning. And I think all teachers need to have a good understanding of that. If we try to teach math through only inquiry-based learning, are they gonna learn their times tables? Are they gonna have a good understanding of the fundamentals? Initial instruction when dealing with new information should be explicit and direct. So behavioural is important. Math, the research clearly shows that teacher-directed learning is better suited. Needless to say, these basic skills must be firmly in place before students can approach problem-solving questions with any degree of competence. 
we see that in times tables. Teachers will say they don't know their times tables, therefore they can't do their long multiplications. There's certain fundamentals that children need to develop. Reading is another one. If they don't know their phonics, they're not going to be able to develop their reading. They're not going to be able to go to the library and enjoy all the wide variety of books if they haven't got those fundamentals. So there is a place when I see phonics being taught in the school, there is a place for the children just to repeat after the teacher, to practice. If you're learning a different language, there's a place to practice and, and, and repeat after the teacher. We don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I think it's important that all teachers have that understanding. So good teachers select, mix and match and combine teacher-centered and student-centered instructional, instructional techniques. So why do we do, we need, I said before about reflecting, why do we do what we do? What works well in our school? Is a curriculum reform, are we changing to make an improvement or is it change, from, uh, change for change sake, which is curriculum change? And you may have seen that already where we change things and you go, do you know what? This was better the way we did it last year. What best suits your context? And especially of international schools, the context is very different. Um, know your areas of curriculum and which approaches, and models, programs, and pedagogy best suits that. We don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Okay. Another, this video here, I'll just quickly share that in Singapore, it was um, looking at them being world leaders in education, but also looking at the other side of it, where some children have had social and emotional mental health issues, where one boy talking, being interviewed by the, um, by the lady, spoke about how he's got two hours homework, and all he wants to do is sleep. So it's finding that balance. And it's about how important well-being is. And we all know, you know, it's about quality rather than quantity with the homework. Um, literature suggests there is global significant ambiguity surrounding the definition, usage, usage and function of health and well-being in the public policy realm and in the wider world. Um, quality physical education to enable holistic health is complex and multifaceted, is heightened by many associated discourses, which we'll touch on, and there's practitioner confusion also with that. Um, classroom teachers are today required to be health and wellbeing experts. All classroom teachers are health and wellbeing experts, but they're not regarded as being PE experts which is a paradox and counteracts the premise of this book. To be a health and well-being expert, one must also be an expert in the physical dimension. If you're teaching early years, three, four, five, six-year-olds, even right up to 11-year-olds, even up to 15-year-olds, you can't say, oh, I'm not in, that's not me, that's not my strength, PE, because you're, that's not developmentally appropriate for the people you're working with. Movement is an important vehicle for children to learn. And so that, it shouldn't be tolerated. They need to be confident and competent. And this begins at university and the expectations. Okay. Um, recently, I, this article was published, Leading School Recovery from the Impact of COVID-19, Two Birds, One Stone. So I studied an MPQSL and I turned the project into a paper. Um, and published. The key findings of the study were well-being is essential to curriculum recovery, and not only to curriculum recovery, but to all learning, enhancing learning. The leader's ability to communicate effectively is very influential to be success. Curriculum change and curriculum reform is a long and complex process, and we can't give up on it. A whole school curriculum approach is vital, and that involves communication and coming together as a staff, and it involves leadership. Physical health is a key to the promotion of well-being. I'll say that one again. Physical health is a key to promotion of well-being. Movement, physical education is very important. Programs such as the MPQSL need to be flexible and open to the most recent research findings with regards to well-being. Challenging deeper thinking is necessary for teachers and not only children in schools. Leaders need to be inclusive in all teachers and teaching approaches and not see someone as old school, but ask them why they do that. And, and have them identify why they do it. And perhaps it is, it, it is the best way with that, in that particular context. Teachers as reflective practitioners of researchers 
They just don't always, it's not always identified that they are. But all teachers are, are researchers. All teachers will share, oh, that didn't work. or well, that worked really well. Or well, let's try combining this. Or they'll sit down after a unit of work and they'll talk about it and see if there can be improvements. Okay, so after post COVID 19, the Department for Education in England had the statutory guidance for physical health and mental well being. So that acknowledgement of the importance of the physical and movement. Physical health and mental well being are interlinked. And it is important that pupils understand that good physical health contributes to good mental well-being and vice versa. So that's really important. That's what I've been um, emphasising. Health and well-being priority. Now, in Australia, the Labor government will invest $200 million to expand the successful implementation of mental health in primary schools programs to every single government and low-fee non-government primary school in Victoria, 1,800 school campuses. So in the state of Victoria. So again, as I said, it's in Australia, the states control the education. They'll have a national curriculum, but the implementation and how they go about it is, is controlled by the states. Scaling up across the state from 2023 to 2026, every school will employ a mental health and wellbeing leader to implement a whole school approach to wellbeing. Now, when I read that, I thought, I saw it on Twitter, I think, bang. Well, that mental health and wellbeing leader why can't that be a physical education, health and well-being leader? This is a, a key way that every school could can um, exploit the movement, enhance the movement and enhance learning. It doesn't have to be separate. When we look at a whole school approach, the health promoting school's been out for many years, I think before the turn of the century, they had three important aspects, curriculum, teaching and learning, partnerships and services, school organisation, ethos and environment. Um, this is a little bit hard to see here, but the physical educating, the elements of quality physical education then has curriculum, teaching and learning focus, the movement priority, the physical dimension focus and the cognitive dimension, the whole child development, so the social, emotional and spiritual well-being health and physical well-being. And that's not we have to sit down and teach about spirituality, but it means that we're just open that children can, it can enhance other dimensions. School implementation, organisation, ethos and environment, the social cultural approach being inclusive, the whole school approach, health promoting schools, that we are about the whole school and that we need to all connect and we can't be separate silos and the leadership and communication, how important that is. And perhaps that, PE teacher needs to take that on and be an advocate if that's what's needed and is in the best interest of the children. And community, the strength-based partnerships, collaboration, and also services. So if your school doesn't have space, perhaps what I did at one school in, in Queensland was we didn't have much space at all, but we had connections with the local rugby school, which was about, you know, six, 700 metres down the road, and we could walk safely there. We'd use it for lunchtime play a few times a week, during the week, and also when we needed to do um, activities that involved more space, we could also use that. So many schools have great partnerships, and this is something that has to be rebuilt after COVID-19. And as you can see in Dulwich College Singapore, there's great partnerships happening um, with, with things like what's going on today. Whole school approach, I think we'll all have an understanding of what that is. Um, it's, it's hard to identify and tell someone how to implement that, but it does involve everyone coming together. It does involve leadership. It does involve monitoring. Um, and it, it does, it, you could almost each term have a staff meeting that is just looking at the whole school approach. And it is, there is um, uh, uh, the, this, there's a physical education, health promoting schools, Healthy schools in, in the UK have a, a monitoring criteria. So if you join that and it doesn't cost much at all, um, they'll give you a criteria that you can follow to ensure that you have a whole school approach. So they're closely related to the health promoting schools from World Health Organization. So well-being, not one single definition. I think we all are fairly familiar with what well-being means for us. But we know that it's the presence of positive emotions and moods, and we can't be positive all the time. We need to have downtime. We need it's okay to cry. It's okay to get angry, but it's to identify that and the reasons for that. 
the absence of negative emotions, satisfaction with life, fulfillment, positive functioning. Now, a definition that I really like is a state of feeling good about ourselves and the way our lives are going. And also to add on to that is that we feel valued and we feel like that we belong. That's a, uh, if I was to ask you now, how do you feel right now, your well-being, one to ten, in your minds, you could you could identify how you are right now. Ten minutes ago, it could be different. You could meet someone in the corridor, and it could change your well-being totally, and it could be different in, in another five minutes. So it's something that we need to constantly just check in with and identify when we're not feeling well, why that is. And it's okay. It's okay if we're not feeling well at the moment because of this, because we're having relationship problems or whatever it might be. We know that... Uh, the latest neuroscientific research has confirmed the powerful role of emotions on children's cognitive mastery, indicating that emotions can either facilitate or impede children's learning process. How important that well-being is for their learning, having that inclusive environment in PE, in classrooms, um, the effect of the teacher and that teacher making them feel like they're important, valued and belong. Another thing to be mindful of is megatrends predict that in the future, educational departments need to be prepared for a quality of life with limited world resources. The world economy shifting from north to south and east to west. Associated healthcare costs and the responses in lifestyles and services and rising importance of social relationships. And I think this, this was from 2012, a study. Um, we're already seeing that through COVID. BBC schools in England told not to cut days over energy price rises. So the costs, the impact the costs have on schools, how does that impact on PE and and resources and being able to, if, if the schools relied on a coach, can they afford a coach to come in? What's the best thing for dealing with, with economical problems in schools? Um, where we spend our money with Sport England, one billion, did it increase sport? In Australia, they use sporting schools which is after school, because there's a problem with time in schools, and we understand that. A similar situation was experienced in Australia in the early 1990s when government programs were used to replace school PE curricula, and that's what we have to be careful of. Does it replace? Because not all children get involved in sports. The Aussie Sport Education Program was used by schools to justify the withdrawal of physical education from schools. This funded government program proved to be detrimental to schools rather than achieve the enhanced health outcomes as originally advocated. Subsequently, Emil argued that programs offered by the state and federal governments should be a logical and welcome extension to the curriculum, not a replacement for it. So when we're looking at things again, what are we doing? Where does this sit? What balance have we got? We don't want to replace PE in schools because that's the only way every child can be contacted, can be connected with. Um, Okay, I'll just dust down here. I'm not going to read all this, but funding for PE, specifically in higher education, teacher preparation and continued professional development, large sums of funding are instead being allocated to physical activity alternatives. QPE is being replaced by physical literacy. By that, I mean the sports outside of school. PE in schools by physical activity offered outside the, of schools and qualified PE teachers by sports coaches. Subsequently, the important role schools play in QPE, teacher expertise in the teaching profession are devalued and excess for some children are denied. We'll come back to that if we have time at the end. If we don't understand the context, if we cannot adjust to economic change, if we cannot form genuine partnerships where both all stakeholders can win, not just one person or one stakeholder or one school, but everyone, it's a win-win situation, we're going to crash. And that goes for PE and sports. If we look at the history. I'll just flick through this really um, quickly, so I know I've been going for quite a bit of time. Um, here, body, mind, and spirit, 1378 to 1446. Believe that the best way to develop health was through gymnastic program, 1759 to 1839. Link health dimensions, subject included. Nature of health was deemed important. Um, prevention was better than cure. Um, 1885 at a at a PE meeting. William G. Anderson went on to um, form what we know as APERD, which turned into Shape America in 2014. So right throughout history, 
Child health in the school touched on that earlier. Right throughout history, we've had the importance of help. Kirk, as I mentioned earlier, 1940s and 1950s, reorganised around well-being of the individual, um, enthusiasm, and enjoyment, not discipline, obedience, and uh, military. ACHPA, which is the Australian Health and PE organisation, used to be the Australian Physical Education Association (APA). The name changed in 1970 to include health. Um, they had a large conference, and as the president at the time said, health is such a large component of what we do. Therefore, they added in to um, to the title of ACHPA rather than APIA. And that was what they were being influenced by from overseas. They wanted these words included. Otherwise, they felt that physical education was too narrow. Dimensions of health, we're all familiar with the various dimensions. Um, on the right, this diagram, perhaps sometimes it's not as perfect and ideal as the one on the left. Perhaps sometimes you only connect with the social, emotional, or the spiritual, or the cognitive, but it's acknowledging that we can enhance all dimensions through the physical. The physical is what phys ed is about. Okay, and it's physical by name. Physical will always be our dimension. The HP learning area recognizes and advocates for the development of all health dimensions. But the core of HPE, as the nomenclature states, is the physical dimension. Health and well-being associated with being physically educated is the key well-being development responsibility of HPE. We cannot take away from phys ed. So what the English syllabus with PE, there is a, a it's significant in that PE then gives, it's all given to the physical. But I'm not saying take away from the physical, enhance, use the, physical and let that be significant in the school, but be open to how important it is for all areas learning. Okay, so the World Health Organization's definition of health, the state of complete physical, mental and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. The enjoyment of the highest attainable standards of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political beliefs, or economic and social condition. That came out in 1948. Again, as Kirk said, around the 1940s, 1950s, we had this openness to health through PE. You can see that importance, and that's still their definition today. It's been around for 70 years, more. Sometimes we just forget. Um, more comprehensive approach to school health and coordinated action across, which I've already talked about. It is argued that the introduction of the multi-dimensions of health within curriculums requires clarity. In the UK, so this was from 2015, but Griggs states, there remains significant ambiguity around the definition, usage and function of health and well-being in the public policy realm and in the wider world. So in the, while well, we had physical education in the UK, we had PSHE, which at the time was the schools had the choice of whether they implement it or not. It is now statutory, but at the time it wasn't. So, and I think that with the physical education um, and physical health and mental health document, also with the relationships document, relationships and sex ed, that it's been given, they've achieved that, and now it is um, being given clarity. Okay, social emotional importance of that social emotional learning in all schools. Traditionally in PE, there's been two philosophical views on PE. One is the body viewed as an object, which does lie in the behavioral model. It's a top-down governmentality medical model. The view of the whole person, body, mind, spirit, and well-being. Another thing about within the physical education programs, um, the phys ed curriculum, which in some schools is implemented really well, in some schools it's not, the UK ranked, when we look at well-being and the holistic approach, ranked last for children's well-being among 21 of the world's richest countries in 2007, 16th among 29 in 2013, and 20th out of 35 of the richest countries in 2016, which I'm sure the UK Department for Education would agree it's not good enough. So maybe more can be done. They argue that physical education in many cases not only fails to achieve many of the outcomes it espouses under the rhetoric of enhanced health, fitness, skills, and self-esteem, but often exacerbates the very problems it seeks to overcome. 
They argue that where physical education is poorly or sensitively taught, it is more likely to have a negative influence on learners than a positive one. Will, um, are you happy for me to keep going? You just tell me when you want me to stop. Yeah, I think uh, there, just conscious of time, Tim. So uh, we, we've got uh, um, other presenters um, who are going to share their yeah, practice. No so, I mean, um, yeah, yeah. How, how much um, how much more are you, are you looking to share? Uh, it's gone in a bit longer than I thought, to be honest. But um, <laughs> yeah, look, you could... If I go for another five minutes, I'll just skip through the through the slides really quickly. Is that all right? Yeah, sure. Okay. So the hidden curriculum, we've heard about the hidden curriculum, the messages that we give, and discourses and ideologies with that. Ideologies being the beliefs. So the different ones over time, military, scientific, health, and sporting, which still exist today. We've seen sexism. The Lionesses won World Cup, and there's lots of um, articles about sexism and pay and, and all sorts of things, which were me with military um, especially during world war one and world war two this was seen as very important and again relating back to the spartans producing soldiers where the body was a docile body and we're going to train it ready scientific in uh, 57 the sputnik the russians sent sputnik up and then it was also all this money spent right we need scientists lots of money inputted what that look like in pe biomechanics, exercise physiology, sports medicine, psychology of sport, history of sport, and so on, which are all important. But we know also that, like you were having after this, the practical side, teachers need to know the practical side and what these things look like, um, how they relate to, to the children. Health discourse, um, you know, the appearance, judgment, morals, and guilt, and being able to acknowledge this of, uh, of when we see this in society. Bodies tell us a story. Unquestioning acceptance of the obesity discourses. Taking the pleasure out of physical activities. Morally disciplined behaviour. Um, let me see what was important here. I'll just keep moving along. Hidden messages. Okay, so here we have, I know in the UK, here's an article, Daisy, where she had, she was weighed in year in reception and, and year six, the children are, are weighed. And this video clip that's associated with this talks about how Daisy's, how it affected her psychologically and where that sits in the behavioral approach. And do we really need it? And what's a sensitive way we can implement this is if this is what we need. Children are measured, BMI, and the letters goes home to the parents saying your child's overweight if they're at a certain BMI. And then, you know, we're concerned they'll end up a weight, uh, overweight adult. There's other inclusive ways that we can go about this without having psychological effects. Um, sporting discourse, and this is important to the English curriculum because in 2012, the Olympic Games, planning of the national curriculum, um, policy by the way, uh, this connection is where dominant discourse and rhetoric are favored over permitted, often without understanding the appropriateness or impact that may result. So with England, they said, right, we want to have, um, we want to relate to having lots of kids play traditional sports and we want to produce athletes so that we can do well in the Olympics, which relates to a lot of discourses and ideologies such as elitism. Um, and when we look at the curriculum, a high quality physical education curriculum inspires all pupils to succeed. Can all pupils succeed? How do we go about this? And excel in competitive sport. Can they all succeed in competitive sport and other physically demanding activities. It should provide opportunities for pupils to become physically confident, great, in a way which supports their health and fitness, right? Opportunities to compete in sport and other activities build character. Do they always? Is the local coach coming into the school building character in all children? Because it takes a lot of skill and help to embed values such as fairness and respect. Okay, so does sport build character in the early years of primary schools? That's the question being asked. And this is it relates back to what we cover at university, preparation of teachers. They have to know how to do this, how, to, how for everyone to achieve. Can sports be played by children? Is it developmentally appropriate for children in year one and two to play sports? There's only a few sports with very basic skills that they can get involved. Um. 
And there are assumptions about sports that relate to that. The boys and girls receive equal opportunity and recognition, get most of the understandings through school curriculum, work hard, and make sacrifices. You can achieve what you want. Being involved in sport, people naturally develop positive attitudes and healthy lifestyles. <laughs> Again, just the question about reception, for enjoyment, it becomes naturally natural for them. They should be developing their fundamental movement skills um, so that when they get into year three, around about year three is where they can really truly play modified sports and start to understand the strategies of games. They can play basic games like Duck, Duck, Goose and things like that, but only in year, towards the end of year two and year three have, do you find the children are ready for that. Um, okay. Sexism, we're seeing this all the time. Um, and this is good that it's identified so it doesn't go through and just the messages get through and just keep growing with children going through school. It's good that the media acknowledge this. It's good that we talk about this. Elitism in schools. Um, I know the school I went to, the first 15 rugby team was given far more weighting than other sports. And all the um, young men wanted to be in the rugby first 15. Okay. So responsible for schooling the body throughout history. Ideology is associated with that. And with a holistic approach, it's about having the ability and power to bring awareness of existing cultural messages to students and their awareness. And then they have the choice to accept or reject messages. And this is what the social cultural inclusive approach does. And it's appropriate to well-being, which is multidimensional, because the dimensions that, that the health is dynamic and constantly changing state. Okay, this is taken from the syllabus in 1999. I'll just keep moving along just to see. I'll go, I'll just actually, quality physical education. This is the answer to everything. Marriage of human movement and social cultural approach being inclusive. It needs to be provided for all children. All educators must understand how to provide inclusive practices, which I've spoken about and touched on. It's acknowledged by UNESCO. Um, Physical education lessons should be development appropriate to help them acquire the psychomotor skills, cognitive understanding and social and emotional skills they need to lead a physical active life. What I might do, looking at quality physical education, um, which is quality education, what we need for that, I'll just skip through that because it'll be revision for most people. The importance of, uh, of feedback, especially in PE. Challenge for teachers especially PE teachers, educators therefore challenge to be creative when implementing physical education by adopting a social cultural approach, inclusive approach. At all times, the aim should be to maintain inclusivity by catering for the diverse needs of the class. For example, if you have a year four class and half of those children play basketball at the local club and have all the skills, half don't, how are we going to manage that? This is easier said than done. It's the greatest contemporary challenge for physical educators. The ability to implement strategies that cater for all needs while enabling enjoyment, engagement and challenges is evidence of a teacher's expertise as a quality physical educator. When I first went into schools and started taking PE, what I realised, the difference between a sporting club and in the schools was how challenging being inclusive was because the children had such a diverse range of interests and skills. If you're a PE teacher, you can begin from the early years and everyone can have the fundamental movement skills and you can move up through that and have the opportunities. But if you just go into a school raw and they haven't had those previous opportunities, the diversity of the children's ability is incredible. And that's a real challenge. And I'm sure one that all PE teachers can um, resonate and, and associate with what I'm saying. My recommendations from my book, from my study, one PE is prioritised, acknowledged as one of, if not the most important curriculum area in the school. PE must be quality PE, where fundamental movement skills and dominant movement patterns to do with gymnastics are, are implemented. Number three, the key wellbeing development and responsibility of holistic HP is associated with being physically educated. The, the physical is always our priority. Four, QPE, quality physical education, is the only label advocated. Now, today's meeting is called Physical Literacy and Health. And in the context, for me, and as you may have seen from some of my slides, that relates to education. 
I see education as being the literacy, same term. But what I, in some of my studies, I've seen that there's confusion with some teachers. They've got to teach PE, what's his physical literacy? And also the word literacy is used a lot with, um, we have financial literacy for clubs. We have um, all different types of computer literacy um, and it's associated with just, I guess, being deep in awareness of that curriculum area. Health literacy is another one where they do talk about health literacy as relating to being able to read and write. So that becomes confusing also. Number five, community partnerships are essential now and in the future. I've touched on that. Number six, a predominant behavioural approach to PE should be avoided as it does not acknowledge the whole child and can be harmful to children's wellbeing. Predominant. Uh, my child was involved recently in uh, synchronised swimming, water ballet, um, artistic, uh, artistic swimming, different names, all the same thing. It's synchronised swimming. And the, the way the coaches who had been to the Olympics taught those kids was through the predominant behavioural approach. A lot of yelling going on, not a lot of rewards, not a lot of um, encouragement. And it was, it was working, the, dropping out the weaker kids. And it did start to have a psychological effect. We cannot have, um, as we know, with all subject areas, we cannot have a predominant behavioural approach Today's world, kids need to take on as researchers and become independent. And it needs to come from within. It can't be from a coach yelling at them or a teacher. PE curriculum must be developed, implemented, and evaluated based on evidence-based research, which we've seen throughout all education and Ofsted and so forth. Teacher education supply and development is the key to enhancing children's wellbeing. Money needs to be put into this area. These billions of dollars being sport on being paid on sport, just take some of that money and pump it into the universities so that teachers are coming out as competent and confident within the physical dimension. All teachers, yes, have, have uh, phys ed specialists, but all teachers need to know how to enhance children's learning through movement. A whole school approach needs to be adopted for health and PE implementation. Specialist teachers are associated with quality delivery of all dimensions of health and physical education. Quality physical education enhances all children's development and learning. Every primary school requires a tertiary qualified health and physical education teacher. And people have been asking for this for years, over 30 years. Carl and Harris, Commonwealth of Australia, myself, uh, from Active Healthy Kids Australia report. Over the years, every school, if we're to be truly fair and inclusive. Um, and that goes on about that. 13, school leadership plays a vital role in optimising children's wellbeing. We know that from our own experiences. Do we have to do it? Yes. How are we doing it? Let's have a look. Can we do it better? And I'll leave it there. Thanks, Will. Cheers, Sam. Thank you very much. Um, I'm obviously conscious of time and obviously to give our other presenters some uh, yes. chance to share their knowledge as well. But obviously Tim's done a great job of um, really setting a scene and obviously a wealth of knowledge and experience there from an uh, academic and uh, obviously in, in school um, practice as well. Um, I'm going to, if Tim's okay to stay on for sort of five more minutes at the end, I'm going to keep this moving.